One of my favorite quotes of all time is somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. Anybody know who said that? Carl Sagan. Um, that's kind of why we're all here tonight, I think, is to learn something. Um, as you guys know, we all took a couple months off to reorganize, and um, I'm trying to give you some information on where we're at with that is that um, we got a whole bunch of new volunteers, and about 10 of us have been working on reorganizing Science Pub. Um, we filed for a corporation and a business license, and we're also about to file for nonprofit status. So. Um, So, I work for a trucking company, and a lot of people are kind of fascinated as to why I do Science Pub. Um, I think the main reason is because I'm an enthusiast. I love science. I love knowledge. I love truth. And um, it's given us a lot of great things. I mean, it put humans on the moon, uh, came up with groundbreaking theories like evolution and the Big Bang, helping to explain where we came from. Uh, produced germ theory, antibiotics, vaccines, which have saved countless lives. Uh, Carl Sagan, he discovered the conditions on Mars before we ever sent a probe to its surface. Um, Rosalind Franklin made critical contributions to the understanding of fine molecular structures of DNA, RNA, viruses, coal, and graphite. And it should be noted that her discoveries were borrowed by her male colleagues and she never received full credit for her work. Science gave us uh, the World Wide Web where information can be accessed instantaneously, giving the searcher a world's worth of knowledge at their fingertips. <sighs> The scientific process is a beautiful thing. As we gain knowledge and experience, our conclusions change. There is no better, better method for truth and discovery. Uh, our mission statement is that we are committed to stimulating an interest in science for the public by organizing entertaining presentations on relevant scientific topics. In order to file for nonprofit status, we're going to need $300 worth of donations. Uh, we're hoping that if you like coming to these events and that you guys are hoping, willing to help, we could really use some donations tonight and in the next few pubs. So we would greatly appreciate that. Um, right now, I'm going to bring James up, and he's going to do our trivia. And uh, thank you. Hi, I'm James. Uh, before I get started, does anybody need an answer sheet? Does everybody have it? Hey guys, uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to mention that uh, Alaska Commons is one of our sponsors. They've been with us pretty close to since the beginning. Uh, we really appreciate their help. If you um, haven't checked out their website, it's www.alaskacommons.com. Um, they're a current events digital magazine that are focused on all things Alaska related. So go check them out. They've been a lot of help. Um, I also want to thank the Taproot. Uh, they've been hosting us since the beginning. We really appreciate their support, the drink tokens, and providing the venue for free. It's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> One last thing is please remember, uh, tip your servers. They work really hard with a big crowd like this. Just, uh, you know, they appreciate our support. So, um, our speaker for the night is Dr. Susan Loren. She teaches at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the UAA. She received her PhD from Purdue University in Indiana, where she completed her thesis on mapping dark matter with weak gravitational lensing and continued on as a visiting scholar with the Veritas collaboration based on the Whipple Telescope. She is also a volunteer for Anchorage Science Pub. Please give her a warm welcome. Uh, and I'll let you know ahead of time if that's not one of them. 
Microphone? Yes. Yeah. Can you guys not hear me? Am I not loud enough? What if I just yell? Can we make this over it? I can uh, yeah. can just kind of point it at me. Thank you. All right. So I'm glad to see that we have some kids in the audience. Hopefully these will be some new demonstrations for you guys. Um, adults, you may have seen some of this stuff before. If not, you're definitely going to see it today. So that's exciting. All right. That looks like it's fighting. It is. It's very um, not wanting to cooperate. I'll just do something like this. OK. That way it's kind of out of your way. OK. Thank you. And then we'll turn it back on. All right. Now you guys are testing. One, two. Testing. One, two. There you go. All right. Okay. Good, good. That's good. Okay. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do, um, and this is going to be maybe more audience participation than science pubs usually are, because you're going to be required to yell out what you think is going to happen. Okay? No. No. All right. We're already on top of it. Okay. So I have this marble track, all right? They all start and end at the same heights. Now, if I let a marble roll down this track, will it take the same amount of time no matter which track I take it down? Yes, no? No. No. No fair, that guy's in physics classes. All right, okay, good. So let's test it out, right? That's. Key here is we're gonna we're gonna test it out. Okay, so we're gonna try these two, which are the most different ones. So we have one that's basically concave and one that's convex. Okay, three, two, one. Oops. Different, right? Different. Okay, so um, you may have guessed though that I would not have brought this demonstration unless some property was going to be the same. What property do you think is going to be the same of the marbles when they get to this end? Their velocity, right? Okay, how can we show that though? What's a, what's a good way to show that? Math. Not math. I mean, yes, math is an excellent way to show that, but um, what we're going to do today is um, I'm going to pause this demonstration and do another one in the middle. We're going to come back to this, okay? All right, so this thing. I'm gonna take my marbles and I'm gonna launch them. Now. The mechanism on this is a spring such that the marble on this side will receive a kick and the marble on this side will just drop. All right? So, the marble on this side will just drop and the one on this side will have some amount of velocity in the horizontal direction. Now, oh, come on. Okay. Now, what property do you think is going to be the same here? Gravity, right? So they're going to, they're going to hit at the same time, right? One, two, three. Did you hear it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to see it again? Sure. Yay! Again, again! All right. Nope, that's on the wrong side. Okay. Here and there. Okay. Three, two, one. Well, that's gone. All right. So, this is demonstrating the principle that even if I have something that has a velocity in the x direction, it doesn't change the way it falls in the y direction, right? Vertically. It doesn't change how long it takes it to fall. So, if we now apply the same principle to this, if the two marbles have the same speed coming off the end, and they'll both fall the same height, they'll both cover the same distance. So all I have to do is put something out here, and if it hits from one track, it should hit from the other. You guys believe this? Let's try it out! Okay. So, I have that large piece of wood there. And kind of measure it out. Yeah. 
So crack, right in the middle of the piece of wood. So now, if I launch both of them at the same time, oh, come on. Let me go. Uh, yeah, my, my marbles are being difficult. Always in, in trouble. Right? They both go the same amount of horizontal distance. Okay. Marble track complete. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, uh, I'm sure that most of you guys. If you, if you watch a lot of science videos on YouTube, this is a really popular one on YouTube. All right? Yes. I can't find the end. There we go. Okay. So, I have here um, a string of beads. And what will happen is... Um, the same thing that happens when you siphon, when you siphon gasoline or you siphon water, especially if you're, if you're siphoning out of the fish tank, right? Um, I'll have more weight at the free end than I will inside, and it will pull. And it will keep pulling until the whole chain comes out. Can you guys see that? Yeah. It's a little bit impressive, right? Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Okay, so here's one of the ones where you don't get to yell again, again, right? That's this takes too long to go back. No. <laughs> I appreciate your enthusiasm, but no. Okay. All right. So here, the next one up is an oldie but a goodie. I'm gonna take this cup, I'm gonna fill it with water, and I'm gonna hold it over my head, and it's not gonna spill on me. Keep in mind, there are no lids. Now. Okay. Ooh. Oh, it's touching the table. Well, that's super loud. All right. Okay. Uh, could you, young young man, confirm that this is wet? Yes. Inside. Yes. It is. Definitely, definitely wet. Okay. So, this one is going to demonstrate a circular motion, right? So, as long as I have it going fast enough, it feels... Um, what the water wants to do is go in a straight line, but the string is uh, in giving a, a force, keeping it moving in a circle, and that keeps it from spilling out. <laughs> yeah. The key to that one is to not try and stop it suddenly. <laughs> okay. Oh, the table is so loud. All right. Um, all right, the next one I'm gonna do, it takes a little explanation. But don't worry, it's totally gonna be worth it. All right, yeah, science. Okay, so here I have a ramp. Prop it up. Just, just like half an inch was all I need. Okay. Okay. So I have a ramp and I'm going to prop it up. I have these two weights. They are identical in every way except this one has weight concentrated towards the center and this one has weight concentrated towards the edge. Now, how are they going to roll? Which one is going to roll faster? Or, since they're so similar, are they going to reach at the same time? What do you guys think? Yeah? All right. We're going to try the run with the more weight, right? We're going to do them at the same time. 
radius. They have the same radius, okay? Three, two, one. <laughs> All right? Let's try that again. Okay. The key distinction here is the distribution of the weight, right? The moment of inertia. One of them is more resistant to the rolling than the other one is. All right, so now I'm going to move out my thing. Here is a um, wheelie. It's a wheelie thing. All right, I'm going to stand on it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so the key distinction here is the moment of inertia, right? When I have my arms spread wide, my moment of inertia will be high, and as I bring my arms in, it will lower. Yeah, I want an assistant for this. For anyone you come up. A round of applause for my lovely assistant. Okay. Um, yes, it's going me. Okay. No, from the arms, Brendan. From the arms. You're spinning. Ah. Faster? No. <laughs> All right, let's start over. Okay. There we go. And okay. <laughs> Dizzy. Yes, very. Um, all right, so are you guys noticing a change in the speed? No. Yes. No? All right, let's try it again. <laughs> Did you see it that time? Okay, so this is the classic um, figure skater. Yeah, I'm gonna Okay, so this is the classic figure skater, right? At the end of her routine, she's got her arms out, she starts to spin, she brings her arms in, and she starts spinning so fast that the camera can barely pick her up, right? That is changing her moment of inertia. All right, now, I'm gonna do another one that involves similar principles uh, involving angular momentum, okay? So, uh, yeah, spin it by me. Keep spinning it fast. Faster. More energy. All right. Now. All right. <laughs> you guys saw it that time. I can tell. <laughs> yes. All right. So what's going on here? <laughs> is the wheel has some amount of angular momentum, right? You have experienced this whenever you ride a bicycle. The motion and the rotation of the bicycle keeps you more stable, right? It keeps you from tipping. That's why it's easy to ride a bicycle fast and hard to ride a bicycle slow, all right? So what I did here was I took the angular momentum and I redirected it. Once I'm on the wheel, I'm isolated. And so, and so the wheel's angular momentum transfers to me. Yeah, it's not as good when Brendan's not spinning. There we go. Like that. Woo! Okay. All right, so this is, very simply put, uh, an example of gyroscopes, right? So who wants to see a big hunk of gyroscope? Oh. Yeah. All right. This is, quite frankly, the most massive gyroscope I think I've, I've seen. Oh, it's very compact. Um, and I, I can't even spin it up by hand. I actually brought a tool specifically for this. I can do it over here, away from the microphone. Um, 
two that just go directly into. We're not using the monitor, so you can you can use this one. You can use this one. Okay, thank you. That should work. Test it out. Yep. Is this tripped? It's right now. Nothing. Yeah, I guess just trying to go inside like that. Thank you. I'll just keep this funny again later. It's uh, angular momentum, right? You guys want to see something else cool? My father that I wanted to be a physicist, of course he said, oh sweetie, you mean engineer. And I said, no, because what I want to do, what I want to do is to be able to put on a magic show, except that I want none of it to be magical. Right? It's all, it's all basic stuff, basic principles. Okay. All right. So now we're going to, we're going to refocus a little bit. I know that you guys read in the description there was something about fire, right? Uh, and I, I have to disclose, I exchanged um, texts with someone from the tablet who said, really, there's going to be fire? And I was like, yes, yeah, it's not open flames, though. So if you came expecting like a big pyrotechnic show, I'm sorry that you're going to be disappointed. Okay. Uh, I know. Oh. All right. So this is um, a pressure tube. All right. And inside is a tiny piece of cotton. Can you vouch that there's... Yes. He says, yes, there is cotton in there. Okay, good. All right. So by virtue of the ideal gas law, if I compress this, I'll decrease the volume. And that will increase the pressure. And the pressure will actually get so high that the piece of cotton will ignite. Huh? Okay. Um, I don't know if this table is necessarily super solid. Let me try this. Yeah, it's a computer. Yeah. <laughs> the stool, the stool. Okay. So the key to this is to compress it really quickly. Um, so I might have to ask for somebody stronger than me to come up and, and just like smack it. But uh, all right, three, two. Nope, not fast enough. Who played uh, tennis in high school? <laughs> All right. Just in case you got bored and looked away, I did actually bother to load a second one. That was 
worth the fire on the advertisement, right? Yeah, so. Okay. All right, so the next thing that we're going to do, I got a lot of clutter here, I got to clean up. We're now going to leave the world that we call mechanics, and we're going to go into the world that we call electro electrostatics. All right, so this is more like electrons, protons, positive and negative charges, that sort of thing. So in genuine Alaskan fashion, I have brought my belt. And what I'm going to do here is I have an empty soda can. Can you please tell them there is nothing in the can? Nothing in the can. Nothing in the can. He's not as enthusiastic as my other uh, participants, <laughs> if, I, if I'm being honest. OK. So we're going to rub this. This transfers electrons from the pelt to the plastic rod. And all I need to do is bring it close. And I can get the can to roll. It's like magnets, but it's not magnets. Trust me, magnets are coming up. What happens if I touch the can? Okay. So that will transfer some of the charge. And now I should be able to make the can run away instead of run towards me. No. Yeah. Look at that. Because they have the same charge. Excellent. Whoever planted person asked that question. Yeah. All right. Okay, so that brings us, all right, so, so we're in electricity and magnetism, right? Um, and they have this really interesting interplay. Oh, I should not do this here. Yes, you should. <laughs> all right. This is probably like a sound dampener, right? So it's okay if I hit it with a projectile? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. So there's this interplay between electricity and magnetism. Electricity can cause magnetism, and magnetism can cause electricity. All right? And what I have here is a big electromagnet. I feed a current through it, and then it has an increase um, in the magnetic field around it. All right? Big electromagnet. All right, so you can, can kind of hear. Yeah. OK. So what's happening is current is going through there. It's changing the magnetic field. And something really interesting happens whenever you have a changing magnetic field. Now, not a static magnetic field, not a big magnetic field, not a small, but a change, and especially a quick change, is that you can actually induce a current in something else. Yes, this button is, is, is the launch button. OK, so what happened there? I, I had a quick changing magnetic field here, which caused an electric field here, because it wanted to oppose the magnetic field. Now the two magnetic fields opposed each other, and the ring shot off. You guys want to see it again? Yeah! yeah. 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 All right. Three. Yes, this is the principle behind a railgun. Three, two, one. <laughs> I have a few other rings uh, here, so I can do this with a, with a few different kinds of metals, right? I have copper, so it definitely works with copper. And just to show you that this is actually flowing electricity, I have a light bulb. Yeah, it's not all a hoax. Okay, good. All right, so there's... There's your principle of induction, right? Uh, that's good for everybody. All right. Now, I know the other thing it said in the advertisement was sparks. Who's ready for sparks? Yeah. Okay. So here, I have a Tesla coil. Don't worry, it's not big enough to hurt you. But it would probably hurt me if I was unsafe. Okay, so. Oh, 
Huh? Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take this Tesla coil and I'm going to show you some electrons. My mom always said, electrons are so small, I've never seen one, I don't believe in them. Ah. After today... Alright, so... Now i got to turn around. Much more impressive, right? Okay. Uh, it's almost laser. So what's happening is um, I'm having, I'm shooting a field of electrons along this phosphorescent screen. It's hitting the screen and the screen is lighting up. So that's what you're actually seeing is the phosphorescence, right? But allow me to introduce to you a magnetic field. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to bend. I switch it, bends the other direction. All right, so who here is old enough to remember cathode ray televisions? Yeah, some people, all right. This is exactly the principle behind a cathode ray television. And actually, if you set your television too close to something magnetic, for example, a DVR, that's when your television screen started to go green, right? Because it uses a magnetic field to direct the electrons at the screen, hit the phosphors, and if you're near another magnetic field, an external magnetic field, it'll screw up which phosphor it's hitting, and it'll show you the wrong colors. Yeah, yeah when you used to have tubes in the old TV. Oh, it's just so cool. Okay. All right, so one more with the Tesla coil. We have this little fella, all right? And this guy is here to convince you that electrons are not just, um, are not just, are not just waves, are not just, they, they, they have a particle component, right? Because they have a momentum. All right, so here I have a little fan. You guys in the back see the little fan? No? All right, maybe you can see it once it starts to move. And that's why I have a cool job. <laughs> okay, all right, so uh, electrons have mass, have momentum, and they're able to hit off of the fan and make it turn, right? And make it move down the tube. You guys, wait, you want to see it again? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it gets kind of stuck if it's right at the end. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Are you guys ready for the for the final the finale, the last demo? Yeah. Yeah. No. no. <laughs> this is, these are all the ones I brought. <laughs> all right. So I know you guys have been eyeing it the whole time. Oh, let me move my phone. The Van de Graaff generator. All right. So you guys have probably seen some stuff with a Van de Graaff generator before. Okay. So this is another one that does electrostatics. All right. So the key here is that there's a belt. And when the belt moves, there's a little um, whiskery thing inside the dome. The whiskery thing scrapes off the electrons, uh, much in the same way that the fur did before, right? And this will end up with an excess of charge. And the key is that all of the charges will be the same kind, right? They'll all, they'll all be negative charges, all right? Hold on. I've been sweating a lot. This might not work. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to call a veto on doing the one with my hair because I don't have the thing to discharge it and I will hurt myself. Okay, but don't worry. We still have a finale. 
Okay, so exactly the same thing that I said would happen with my hair, will happen with the pie plates. They'll all get in excess of the same kind of charge. And as they do, they will repel each other. Thank you for coming to my show. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to ask any questions that you want at this point. Thank you. in the Tesla coil. All right, so what's happening inside the Tesla coil is actually the same thing that's happening inside the ring inductor. All right, it's got a, a coil of electromagnets and it comes to this very, very focused tip at the end and what happens is it creates this electrical discharge. It's actually mini lightning. So, um, and I don't know if you noticed that uh, the sparks were purple. That's because the air that it's ionizing is purple, right? So when it, when it discharges, the air that we're breathing all the time. That's mostly nitrogen, but some oxygen and some, you know, um, those, those atoms discharge as purple and that's why you see the spark as purple. Thank you, I didn't really go into very much detail about the Tesla coil, even though it's awesome. Yes, is there a question over here? Right here in front. Oh, right here in front. Uh, what would happen if I put the Tesla coil next to the Van de Graaff generator while it was on? And the answer is sparks. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> I can't have them both plugged in at the same time, um, but even if I did, the sparks from the Van de Graaff Tesla um, combination won't be any bigger than the sparks just from the Tesla coil because uh, the natural limit that it's reaching is, is due to the air and not due to either instrument. Good question. All right, uh, at least one more. You guys have at least one more question. Yes? You said about magnets and, and all that. What to do with magnets, computers, cell phones, and that? Is that physics or is that just... That is absolutely physics. Okay, so the way that data is stored on computers is magnetic. And so if you get it near a magnet, that will um, re-flip all of, all of the magnetic uh, things that it has. Can you be more specific? As to your question, and maybe I can. Yes, very strong magnets will interfere with cell phones, computers, um, credit cards. The the old kind of credit card would add the magnetic strip. Um, you could you could also erase those. That is absolutely true. Yes. Yes. So the electrons are moving due to an electric field. The electric, oh yes. So in your house, um, he's asking if the current in, in the wires in your house, if that moves back and forth, or if it moves all one direction. And the answer is, due to, there's an electric field. The electric field pushes everything in one direction. But um, those electrons are, are hitting off of other atoms, other, other things as they go. And so they actually, the bulk motion, is, is slow, slowly but surely in one direction, but with a lot of jitter. The reason that your light turns on immediately, right, like if you flip the switch and then the light turns on immediately, is because that electric field moves at the speed of light. And so the electric field is affecting everything in the wire in the same way. Does that make sense? No? If only I had a diagram. <laughs> Yes, um, it doesn't it doesn't work as a force the same way that like you pushing on something does. I mean, we use pushing as an analogy, but most of the time, what happens is that it feels this kind of the force that was that was on the on the soda can, right? And that force interacts differently with positive and negative, right? So 
as she pointed out, when I touched the thing to the soda can, I got it to roll in the opposite direction. That's because it had an excess of the opposite side of charge, right? So the red and the black are indicating different directions for the charge that you want it to go. If you want more detail, ask me after. Yes? Because the strip on the back is a series of um, Why is it a credit card? That's an excellent point. Um, uh, he says if he has a credit card, why does it stop working if he has it next to a magnet? And it's because the the strip on the back um, is a series of things that are directional and that direction is based on magnets. So when you get it close to a magnet, it rearranges the directions of those things. Okay, that was the last question. Thank you for coming. This was a wonderful science class.